But I think one of the biggest problems, and I, and I think some of you can spot some of the uh, fallacies in Matt's reasoning tonight. Uh, you might call it a category error, or you might call it the error of reification. Just because you have a word for something doesn't mean that's a thing. Just because you have a word like forgiveness. Oh, so there must be a big capital F forgiveness out there somewhere that we need to look for, right? Just because you have a word like logic or morality doesn't mean that those are things. Matt's trying to play this word game to turn words into transcendent things. Logic is a transcendent thing, when actually logic is not. Logic is, as he quoted from my book correctly, and I like to be quoted, um, uh, logic is a part of, the, of a functioning of a brain. Apologists often say that you can't do science unless you assume that the laws of logic and the laws of physics are transcendent. In response to this assertion, I often like to quote Stephen Hawking, who said that a scientific theory exists only in our minds and does not have any other reality, whatever that might mean. The fact that things in the universe act according to certain regularities does not mean that there is some transcendently or platonically existing rule that forces them to work that way. Did God wake up one day and say, oh, look, Oh, I created a universe. Well, now I'm going to decide to do that. Obviously, in the mind of a god, whether he's in time or out of time, whatever the heck that could possibly mean, let's just assume that means something, this god has to have, be in his own mind, a series of preceding antecedent decisions and wants and thoughts. And according to your own logic, if an actual infinity cannot exist in reality, because we never would have traversed it, then God himself must have had a first thought. Too and nice. that shows how your argument is turning around and inviting itself in the posterior. Not only does it not make sense to speak of God making a choice without time in which to make it, the idea of a timeless God also implies that his choice had no causes. If God freely decided to create the universe, that decision had no cause. In other words, Yahweh created the universe for no reason. It was an entirely capricious act. The transcendentals exist. By nature, they are not dependent upon space and time for their validity. I did not say logic is logical. I said, trend, I said the laws of logic. That's what logic is based upon. These laws of logic are the issue. How is it that we can have laws of logic, which are propositions about things? Material objects and properties are not about things. Bullshit. As I've said many times before, if a rock falls into some mud, the shape of the impression it makes is information about the shape of the rock. When a brain makes a statement, it is carrying out a physical process, and that physical process also is about something. Statements are about things. The law of identity, law of non-contradiction, etc. are propositions, they're truth propositions. How do they obtain their universality in an atheistic worldview? We don't know that they have universality. In the absence of brains which conceive of them, they are meaningless. Before the first nervous systems evolved, I don't think there was any such thing as logic. That doesn't mean that things could defy logic, it simply means that without brains which conceive of the laws of logic, there was nothing to form these concepts, or any concept. Sometimes you're yeah. having to choose between the lesser of two evils, but basically, atheists think the harm principle is a good way to live a moral life. You win by definition when you define something to be what it is and say this is why it's right. That's what Dan did. Harm is what reduces good. So therefore, since he's defined it that way, when you reduce, excuse me, harm is when you reduce harm, excuse me. So when you define it that way, well then you win the debate if we're debating something like that. What justifies a definition as being the right one? Because people like it, what justifies that as being the right motive? What justifies saying that acting according to a god's nature is the right way to define morality? Slick has argued in the past that we are obligated to act in accordance with Yahweh's nature because he created us, but what justifies that obligation? Matt, why doesn't God transcend the rules of science and nature to heal devout amputees, for example? He's chosen not to, the same way he did not heal my son Jacob at my beck and call. Apologists frequently miss the point of this question. The reason we bring up the fact that Yahweh hasn't healed amputees is because we often hear reports that he healed cancer victims or people with some other health problem. The devout frequently tell us that he heals disorders that either go away on their own or go away with conventional treatment, or that are less conspicuous than an amputation and thus may have been psychosomatic, but he doesn't heal amputees. Why the double standard? Why are amputees less deserving of being healed than cancer? 
cancer victims. If he chooses not to heal them, why does he choose not to? It seems weird that Yahweh will heal some people, but refuses to heal anyone with a conspicuous, irreversible condition whose healing could be clearly and scientifically documented. 